Okay, it's my pleasure to introduce Travis Mecca, uh, who's going to be talking to us today. Travis did his PhD at the University of Texas at Austin, and then went on to a postdoc at, postdoc at Aarhus University in Denmark, um, and then another postdoc at Harvard CFA. Uh, he then began his circuit of, of Colorado institutions. So he moved to Colorado with a NSF Astronomy and Astrophysics Fellowship, worked at High Altitude Up Observatory, uh, for almost a decade, then on to Space Telescope, uh, Space Science Institute. And now he is executive director and uh, a senior research scientist at Lake Worth Research Corporation, which is still in Boulder, Colorado. All right, take it away, Travis. <clears throat> thanks so much, Jen. Well, uh, thanks so much for joining on during finals week. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, but I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about what I consider to be uh, the most substantial revision of magnetic stellar evolution in a generation. And I, hopefully I can convince you of that by the end of the talk. Uh, and this change in our understanding of magnetic uh, evolution has implications for where are the best stars to search for advanced civilizations. Uh, and so I'll throw that into the mix as well. Uh, so I'll just start with a little bit of motivation and background, um, go on to describe the initial findings that led us on this path uh, five or so years ago, uh, and then show you some of the latest results toward the end. Okay. So, one of the motivations for this work is to try to understand the life stories of stars like the sun. Uh, and if you want to understand something as simple, as basic, as uh, why does the sun have an 11 year activity cycle, um, then, you know, here's the data point. You know, the sun activity cycle of uh, 11 years, rotation period, sidereal rotation period of about 25 days. Uh, there you got your data point. And it's interesting, but um, it's sort of like uh, trying to understand the sun without the context provided by other stars. It's sort of like trying to understand a population um, with an opinion survey, survey that only includes one participant, right? Um, so, you know, dynamo theorists believe there is probably a relationship between the activity, magnetic activity cycle period of the sun and its rotation period, but with a single data point, you really are not in a position to understand what that relationship might be. Now, when you add the context provided by other stars, suddenly the sun appears quite interesting. Um, so this is a plot reproduced from Erika bohm vitense in 2007, who uh, showed uh, the rotation periods and cycle periods of stars from the Mount Wilson survey, which I'll talk a little bit about later, uh, only the, the very, very best observations uh, in that survey, stars with excellently uh, characterized activity cycles and rotation periods. And what she found is that there is not one relationship between these two observables, but actually two different relationships. And the sun uh, doesn't fall along either of them. Uh, and so, um, that's quite interesting, and I'm going to come back to our improved understanding of why that might be the case toward the end of the talk. The other thing uh, that magnetic evolution has a bearing on is the suitability of extrasolar planetary systems to host life. Uh, and so this is a diagram of uh, stellar mass versus the distance of any planets from the, uh, from the host star in AU. It's a log-log plot, and so it's mostly M dwarfs down here. But here's the solar system at the top for reference. Uh, and so the usual thing is, you know, there's this habitable zone, a Goldilocks zone, uh, a range of distances from the star where liquid water could potentially exist. And that's how it's traditionally been defined. The habitable zone is where the range of distances where liquid water could exist. If you're closer, it's, it's uh, all boiled off. And if you're farther away, it's all locked up in ice. 
Um, and there's two different sort of ranges depending on whether you take into consideration the possibility of atmospheres, the planets can change a little bit and so widen that habitable zone somewhat. Um, but there are two uh, interesting features in this diagram uh, that are particularly relevant for the lower mass stars where a lot of the, that are where planets are easier to find because um, the stars are small. And so for the, if you're looking for planets by uh, using the transit method, uh, small planets are easier to find around small stars because they make a bigger photometric signature. Um, and also they're close, the habitable zone is closer in. And so the planets move around faster. So you get more transits in a given length of observations. So lots and lots of transit surveys are finding uh, habitable Earth-sized planets, so-called habitable Earth-sized planets around M dwarfs. But there are other considerations besides just the presence of liquid water, right? Um, one is the tidal locking radius. So if, you're, if, you're too, if the planet is too close to the star, then tides will actually lock the planet so that one face is always uh, pointed toward the star, just like the moon is around the Earth, right? Uh, so that could have implications for the suitability of life. Maybe there's a hot side and a cold side and you only get life around the terminator, for example. Um, but you can see that the tidal locking radius, the habitable zone of m is almost entirely inside that. So unless the planet has a third body like a moon uh, to transfer angular momentum to, uh, it will be tidally locked in the habitable zone for basically all m -dwarfs. The other one that is not often considered is the Alfane radius. Um, and that is the radius inside of which, uh, if, a, if the planet had an Earth-like magnetic field, uh, that magnetic field would connect directly to the stellar magnetic field, right? Outside of that radius, you have some potential of blocking the space weather, uh, having some protective effect like the Earth does. But inside that radius, uh, you essentially don't. And you can see, for the planetary systems uh, around Trappist-1, for, for example, uh, part of the hab habitable zone of that star, so some of those uh, planets are actually inside that Alfane radius. And um, simulations of the space weather environment of that planetary system have shown uh, that there is a direct connection between if the magnetic field existed on the, on the planet, it would connect directly to the stellar magnetic field. And that's bad news if you're worried about radiation and charged particles, right? So, okay, and I'll come back to that theme towards the end as well. Okay, so if we're interested in developing a relationship between uh, stellar magnetism over time and evolutionary picture, uh, we need ages. And traditionally that means clusters. That's uh, where ages are readily available in the past. Um, so now we have the Gaia mission, which uh, solves two big problems uh, in, in, in um, trying to precisely define the ages of clusters. One, you know the positions and proper motions of all the stars, uh, so you can assess membership much more reliably than you have been able to in the past. Um, and what's the other thing? I forgot this part. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and the precision is just like ridiculous, right? So these very, very, very tight main sequence uh, of, of a given star. So the idea of, of trying to define the age of a cluster is that uh, in a cluster, all the stars are born essentially at the same time out of the same material. Uh, and so um, if you just plot a color magnitude diagram like these, um, then you have a main sequence. And um, because more massive stars evolve more quickly, you sort of get a peeling off of the higher mass stars at the top and uh, how far down the main sequence, the stars have peeled off the main sequence basically tells you the age if you couple it with, with some isochrones. Okay. Uh, and the farther it's peeled off, the older the, older the cluster. Um, looks like there's a really wide main sequence down here. Does anybody know what causes that? 
Binary. Yeah, that's that's binaries. So that's that's the binary. Uh, so you have two stars about the same brightness. They're creating another main sequence up there that is that is appears to be more luminous than the the real one, right? Great data, and this is even I think this is several years old, and so you know Gaia has improved much much beyond this even now, right? Okay. Now, the other thing you need besides ages to develop a relationship between magnetism and age is some measure of the magnetism. And so traditionally what, uh, what has been used is calcium H and K emission. Now the motivation for this, if you look at the sun uh, in the photosphere in just white light, uh, you see these dark spots that we've known for a long time are magnetic regions of the sun. If you look at, at the same point in time uh, in the chromosphere, sort of a hotter region above the photosphere, you see those dark spots as well, but all around the spots, you get this bright emission. In this is uh, an image taken in the calcium K line. Uh, you get a, a bright regions around those spots. And in addition to that, you get this whole sort of network of magnetic uh, elements across what over here looks just like quiet sun. Right. And so emission in the cores of the calcium H and K lines has been used as a proxy for the strength and filling factor of magnetic field for exactly this reason. And there's sort of two different measurements, direct measurements of, of these lines that have been used uh, historically. So one of them is called the S index. It was developed at the Mount Wilson Observatory in the late 1960s. Um, so this is a spectral region centered on the calcium H and K lines. And uh, so the cores of these lines, you can see this is a solar spectrum. And so you can see a little bit of a emission in the cores of those lines where that's caused by magnetism. Uh, and and the, the S index basically just measures the, uh, the strength of emission in these line cores relative to these two sort of pseudo continuum band passes on either side. And this makes it a relative measurement. So you're insensitive to things like continuum normalization and, and atmospheric changes, right? The continuum can get uh, change its slope and, and this ratio of, of H and K versus R and B will, will, will uh, the, the changes will cancel out. So it doesn't have to be an absolute measurement. It's an easier measurement to make. Uh, and this little alpha factor here is just a, a fudge factor so that you can calibrate measurements from any instrument onto the Mount Wilson system that was specific to, a, uh, to one instrument at the Mount Wilson Observatory. So it's just a way of like uh, observing the same stars and then calibrating your measurements to the same scale, right? Now the S index is good for sort of tracking the changes in magnetism in an individual star over time. But if you wanna compare stars with different properties to each other, uh, then you need something that corrects for the differences in the bolometric luminosity of the star, which will also change all these uh, individual factors in ways that are predictable. So um, that um, measure is called R prime HK. And basically it's the S index that you measure times some, some function of the B minus B color that corrects for the bolometric luminosity. And then uh, you also subtract a small contribution of emission in the line cores co uh, in the, that's caused from the photospheric emission rather than the chromospheric emission. And that varies with spectral type. And so you need to make that correction too. It's just an empirical correction. Uh, so once you have something, uh, the R prime HK, you can basically, you have an a, a relatively absolute uh, measure, a comparable uh, measure of magnetic activity that you can compare G stars to K stars to M stars, okay? All right. No, was the survey is all spectroscopic, is that right? Yes. Has I mean, I'm trying to do this with photometric interference filters. Uh, so it, the original instrument at the Mount Wilson Observatory was um, was actually a, f a photoelectric, like a, f uh, a, f a photo tube with a with a, some kind of a scanning mechanism. So it it was technically photometric. I see. Yeah, um, but everything everything most of what's been done since then has been spectroscopic with CCDs and and the shell spectrographs. Right, uh, a lot of a lot of um, the later work 
uses modern instrumentation. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so just a little bit of background on the Mount Wilson survey. Um, basically, it was started in, in the mid 60s um, by Olin Wilson uh, at Mount Wilson Observatory, and he wanted to answer the question do other stars show magnetic cycles the way the sun shows an 11 year cycle? Uh, and so he set out to, on a decade long project to monitor this uh, S index in a sample of like 100 stars at the 100 inch telescope there. Um, and what he found at the end of the decade was, yes, indeed, uh, there are other stars do show uh, variations that resemble the solar cycle, um, but they have a, a variety of lengths. Um, uh, some are shorter, some are longer, depending on the spectral type of the star. Um, the project was sort of uh, taken over by some of his protégés um, after that initial decade. And in the 1980s, they moved it to the smaller telescope, the 61 inch at the uh, Mount Wilson Observatory so that they could use more of the uh, observing time, basically, um, and expand the sample. Uh, and so in the 80s, they basically started monitoring night, making nightly measurements uh, rather than weekly or monthly or that sort of thing, uh, to try to get the higher cadence to be able to sample things like rotation. Um, and these are plots of, so the S index versus time for the first sort of 25 years of the survey. This is the latest publication that occurred in the history of the survey in the mid nineties. And you can see, you know, uh, these are some of the most excellent magnetic cycles that were in the survey. Um, but the full range of cycle periods that they found, you know, ranged from two and a half years, which is kind of the shortest you can do with, with annual sampling. Uh, up to about 25 years, which is close to the length of the survey. Um, so that 11 year cycle in the sun, you know, there's, there's some variation around that depending on, on, on um, spectral type. But that is the gold standard of survey and, and others have, have tried uh, to follow in its, in its stead. Uh, there's a long standing survey at the Lowell Observatory that's just recently ended, um, but, uh, so the combined time series are maybe 50 years at this point, and um, it's really hard to make decadal time scale uh, observations in a you know, funding uh, environment where, that sort of awards projects on a three year basis, right? This scatter is real scatter. This is actually a observation. It is real scatter, yeah. In fact, I'm, that's the next slide, whoops, okay. Yeah, so uh, here's just a zoom in. So here's the here's one example of, of a cycle period in a star, and that scatter is indeed not measurement noise. If you zoom in on one of those years, right, what you see is that it is actually rotational modulation. So you have, it's just the same way that Kepler detects um, photometrically spots from as they rotate in and out of view. If you do this in the H and K lines, it's just active regions producing emission rotating into and out of view. And so you can see the rotation period of the star. And from year to year, you can make those rotation measurements. And if the cycles proceed in other stars the way that they do, and <coughs> then the, the active latitudes change over time. And because the different latitudes have different rotation periods because of the differential rotation of the sun, the fast equator and the slower poles, um, season by season, you can make those rotation measurements and put constraints on the differential rotation of other of other stars, even without access to knowing, you know, specifically which latitude they're coming from. Okay, so if you put those ages together with um, measurements of activity and measurements of rotation, you bring it all together, um, you can take a first stab at understanding how rotation and magnetic activity vary over the lifetime of sun-like stars. And the, and the first uh, most famous uh, attempt at this uh, was done by Andy Skumanich in 1972, uh, using you know observations of sun-like stars in a few young clusters with with known ages at the time, and then the sun sort of anchoring the late the late ages where we know the age from uh, meteoritic uh, the meteoritic value from um, geological evidence effectively, uh, and what he found was that. Uh, Apparently, rotation slows and activity decays 
with roughly the square root of the age. It's just a power law. Uh, and they just decline in tandem. Um, but crucially, uh, we don't, in 1972, we didn't have ages for any stars beyond the age of the sun. And we had very few uh, between sort of the oldest cluster at half a billion years. And, and we had nothing between half a billion years and the sun. So, you know, we could do better. We, as of 2008, um, things improved considerably. We filled in this picture uh, quite a lot. So here we're, we're plotting the rotation rate relative to the sun uh, as a function of the age. And each of these cloud of points here is a single star cluster. So it's a distribution of rotation periods uh, for a given star cluster. And what you find is that there are, the story is a, a little bit more complicated than a simple power loss, particularly in the, in the youngest phases. So stars are born with a range of initial rotation rates. Uh, and, and during the first uh, few million years, they, uh, the rotation is actually locked to the protostellar disks. Um, but eventually uh, they contract onto the main sequence and, and spin up. Um, and that's when the, the Skumanich regime really begins. And we now understand that um, that, that power law uh, decrease with the square root of the age, which is sort of schematically this, this arrow, that's the average rotation rate changing as magnetic braking operates, okay? So magnetic braking is uh, that a star uh, is losing angular momentum to its magnetized stellar winds. Uh, so the uh, particles, charged particles in a stellar wind are sort of entrained in the magnetic field uh, out to some radius and where they shed the angular momentum. And uh, the rate of angular momentum loss from magnetic braking depends like the, the cube of the, of the, of the rotation rate. Uh, and so things that started out initially rotating quite fast uh, lose angular momentum more quickly from magnetic braking, while those that were born uh, more slowly rotating uh, don't lose as much angular momentum. And this leads to a convergence so that by, you know, less than a billion years, you basically have forgotten the initial conditions and everything is on that Skumanich uh, spin down regime. Okay. But again, even as of 2008, uh, we basically had no uh, stars with, you know, in the age range between about half a billion years and the sun. And we certainly didn't have anything beyond the age of the sun. And so those were untested regimes in this, in this picture. All right. So what happened just after 2008? Hmm. Uh, the Kepler mission was launched in 2009 and it completely changed our understanding of the second half of stellar main sequence lifetimes, their rotational and magnetic evolution. That's what I'll get to in this, in this second part. So just a little bit of background. Kepler uh, is a planet hunting mission with exquisite photometric pre precision. It pointed to this 100 square degree field in the summer Milky Way and observed you know, a couple hundred thousand stars with a 30 minute cadence, um, sufficient certainly to measure rotation. And some subset of those were observed with a higher cadence that's necessary to detect solar-like oscillations. So the kinds of oscillations that we see in the sun. Um, and it stared just at that one patch for four years. So really long time series, very precise. Um, it went on after, uh, after some reaction wheels uh, made it not be able to point everywhere in the sky it could still point in the ecliptic plane. And so it went on to observe a series of fields in the ecliptic plane, which is great because there's a bunch of star clusters there. So that also helped our understanding of what's going on in the clusters. Um, but it crucially brought two, uh, two types of measurements that were essential to this kind of study. So one, is the photometric precision was uh, sufficient to detect the modulation from star spots of stars that were uh, you know, only as active as the sun, just kind of a middle-aged star, but even, even less active stars. So right, the full scale here is plus or minus 0.1%, so like a, a millimagnitude is the full scale. Uh, and this is a light curve uh, 
uh, over almost four years. Um, and what you see is the regular modulation as star spots are rotating into and out of view. Um, this type of measurement is available for tens of thousands of stars in the original Kepler field. But in addition to that, um, as I mentioned, so some small uh, number at any one time, Kepler was also making measurements with one minute cadence uh, for 512 stars at a time, but you could change them over time. And so over the course of the mission, a couple thousand stars were monitored with this, with this cadence uh, that's sufficient to detect solar-like oscillations. So let me tell you a little bit about that. So basically any star uh, with an outer convection zone, the Convection in the outermost regions is basically producing uh, sound waves like across a wide range of frequencies. Some of those sound waves um, are resonant inside the spherical cavity of the star and set up standing waves that you can observe as parts per million variations in the brightness uh, that follow a very specific pattern, this comb-like pattern. Uh, and the characteristics of this comb-like pattern so basically the, the comb is, a, you, it's a series of radial overtones of these standing waves inside the, the, the cavity of the star. Um, and there's a couple of like kind of global quantities uh, of these oscillations that you can use to characterize the star. So one is the, the frequency of maximum power. So where in frequency uh, do you get the, the peak of this sort of Gaussian distribution? Um, so that basically tracks the surface gravity of the star, okay? Um, the second key ingredient here is the so-called large frequency separation. So that's the frequency spacing between oscillation modes that have the same geometry, um, but have uh, consecutive radial overtones, okay? Uh, that is basically a measure of the mean stellar density. Okay. Um, there's a third quantity that doesn't get talked about too much because it's, it's a little bit harder to measure and that's the so-called small frequency separation. And this is the frequency separation between a radial mode and a nearby oscillation mode that is a quadrupole uh, geometry. And the difference between those two modes is radial modes travel directly through the center of the star and oscillate like that, like uh, the, standing, the standing wave oscillates directly through the center of the star. Whereas this quadrupole mode actually has a turning point uh, somewhere outside of the center of the star, just, just outside the, so like basically this blue ray path here. So it turns around uh, because uh, of the uh, gradient in the sound speed, uh, it turns around and sets up standing waves that, that do something funky, like a little star-like pattern. The key is that uh, as the star ages, it is converting hydrogen into helium in that core. And so the radial mode uh, is sensitive to those changes in composition, which change the sound speed, and so change the frequency of that oscillation mode. Whereas the, uh, the quadrupole mode that doesn't go through the core doesn't feel that change. And so the spacing between those two frequencies is a proxy for the age of the star, okay? So that's what the small frequency separation gets you. Now, of course, with Kepler's exquisite observations, this is actually uh, observations of the solar, like the solar analog 16 sig uh, A from the Kepler mission. Uh, and you don't just get those global quantities, you get actually each of these individual frequencies, which you can model in detail to even better characterize the interior of the star and put constraints on things like the composition, the mixing length, uh, and so on, and get better constraints for everything else, the mass, the radius, the age, okay? All right. All right, so Kepler gave us a big sample of rotation periods. It gave us a nice sample of ages measured from astroseismology. And when you put those two things together, uh, there was a surprise. Uh, and the surprise was uh, that if you expected from the Skubanich relation, the sort of standard spin down picture, well, it turned out that somewhere around middle age, uh, 
stars in the Kepler field that were older than that um, were rotating more quickly than we expected. And Jim Van Saders uh, led a nature paper in 2016 that attempted to explain this behavior using a single parameter. And that parameter is uh, a critical value of the Rossby number, which is the ratio of the rotation period to the convective overturn time scale. Um, a single parameter that where this, at this critical value of the Rossby number, you would just stop magnetic braking in its tracks. And, and the star would only evolve, continue to evolve from changes in its moment of inertia. Okay, so like here it's beginning to expand onto the subgiant branch. And so even though you don't have magnetic braking anymore, as it expands, it conserves angular momentum. And so it slows down again, right? But very, very different from this uh, standard spin down expectation. So because there were measurements of rotation in stars that were sunlight, but also hotter stars and cooler stars that are not, are not shown here, um, turned out that a single value of that critical Rossby number could explain all these observations um, with, that, with that picture that somewhere around middle age, stars stop magnetic braking or the magnetic braking is severely reduced in efficiency, okay? Uh, and that critical Rossby number turned out to be about the Rossby number of the sun. So that's interesting, very interesting. Okay, now to be fair, uh, you know, that is a sample of just a handful of stars. And so people were skeptical. Eh, maybe there's some problems with the seismology of, for old stars or whatever it is, right? Um, and so in 2019, uh, Jen kind of extended this study to the full population of stars in the Kepler field that had uh, measured rotation periods. Uh, and you can, uh, so they have measured rotation periods, you know their effective temperatures, but you don't have the detailed information that astroseismology can provide, but it's a much, much larger sample. And um, so that sample is shown in blue here, and the comparison in the background with the red there is a forward model of the Kepler field. What would you expect the rotation distribution to look like in the Kepler field if everything just spun down continuously like this Gumanich relation, right? And what you find is that you know, uh, for rotation periods longer than the sun at the, at the solar temperature, there's just not a lot of, uh, of uh, measured rotation periods up there, even though you'd expect to be able to see a lot. You'd expect a lot of uh, slowly rotating solar type stars that do not appear. So the question is, okay, is it a, is it a detection bias? That was one of the first things. Well, maybe, maybe you just are no longer sensitive to rotation periods at these, at these longer, more slowly rotating stars in the Kepler field. That over the last couple of years has just been put to rest uh, in part by uh, work by Oliver Hall uh, last year where he reproduced basically this distribution using stars uh, where you could measure the rotation periods astroseismically, right? So uh, stars are a little bit like electrons in the sense that uh, you have degenerate modes that um, you need some deviation from spherical symmetry to lift the, uh, the, the, de the um, degeneracy of these oscillation modes. And rotation is one of the ways to lift that degeneracy. And so it splits the oscillation modes, uh, you know, from a axisymmetric to a non-axisymmetric mode suddenly have different frequencies and you can measure the rotational splitting of those oscillation modes. So this technique for measuring the rotation um, it measures the rotation near the surface, not exactly at the surface, but it has completely different um, detection biases than the method of just detecting star spots in the life, light curve, right? So, and it ended up showing the same distribution with this sort of hard cutoff uh, near the rotation period of the sun, um, even with those different detection biases. So you can't blame biases in this detection method for the distribution that's observed. That's not the reason why we don't see these slower rotators. Okay. The second key test is that if it turns out to be true that magnetic braking turns off uh, somewhere along this, this cutoff, then if you look along that cutoff, you ought to see 
stars with a range of ages all along um, at the same rotation periods, right? They, if they spend the second half of their uh, main sequence lifetimes stalled at that same rotation period, then, then if you just um, have some way of measuring the ages of stars near that uh, edge, you should see a full, a full a range of ages, not just a single age, right? And that was confirmed earlier this year by Trevor David, Trevor David and collaborators that um, once you uh, improve this plot with more precise effective temperatures to sort of snap the picture into focus, um, you do indeed find that along that edge, there are stars with a whole range of, uh, of ages that sort of span the second half of the main sequence. Okay, so the, the debate has shifted from um, does weakened magnetic breaking actually happen in sun-like stars to why? Why does weakened magnetic breaking happen? And that is sort of the segue to the next bit. So this is our current best understanding, a kind of a cartoon picture, not yet a predictive model, but a cartoon picture of what might be going on to cause this change in magnetic breaking. So the first thing is that as rotation slows, uh, it becomes non-differential. Um, differential rotation in sun-like stars is basically the consequence of convection under the influence of Coriolis forces. Sim large simulations of, of convection uh, now naturally produce differential rotation. You don't have to impose it. Um, and and that's what you get basically as you slow further and further when you're really rapidly rotating you get you get these different regimes of 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 influence of um, rotation on the convection you're very fast rotating you get these like sort of banana cells near the equator um, that's a so-called taylor proudman condition um, as you slow further you get normal like sort of solar like differential rotation with the fast equator and slower poles but eventually um, there's the uh, rotation is too slow to, to imprint substantial Coriolis forces on the convection, and you just uh, lose the differential rotation. Now, that differential rotation is one of the key ingredients in the dynamo to convert field from one state to another. And so if you lose the shear from differential rotation, um, you basically lose the ability to convert field from uh, this sort of large-scale poloidal uh, configuration to the smaller scale toroidal field that gets wound up at the base of the convection zone and emerges as sunspots. Um, so you basically sever the dynamo loop, okay? Um, you, you, uh, you cut the ability of the star to recycle its own magnetic field. Um, this turns out to be important for magnetic breaking because the strength of magnetic breaking depends critically on the geometry of the magnetic field, okay? So these are simulations of, of uh, stellar winds, and this uh, sort of white dashed line here is the so-called Alfane radius that I talked about earlier, uh, where the uh, stellar wind breaks free from the magnetic field lines. And uh, the, the, the background color is basically a measure of the angular momentum content of the wind, where red colors uh, represent a large amount of angular momentum and blue colors represent a smaller amount. And uh, so what you find is the Alfane radius is much, much larger for the dipole component of the magnetic field than, uh, and it grows progressively smaller as the field becomes more and more complex. And so something like 80% of the angular momentum loss uh, of a normal magnetized stellar wind can be attributed to the dipole field alone. So if you uh, reduce your differential rotation, disrupt the ability to convert field from one geometry to another, eventually you will uh, compromise your ability to organize field on the largest scales that are the most effective at shedding angular momentum and you effectively shut down magnetic breaking, okay? That's the cartoon picture. So 
how does this jive with with reality? We can we can start to test these ideas by using some of these metrics that we've developed to measure magnetic fields in other stars. So one of the things that puzzled us for a little while uh, is that if you look at the activity age relation, uh, it's perfectly continuous. It doesn't have that sort of uh, stalling the way that the rotation age relation does. Um, and that puzzled us for for uh, a little bit. So this is uh, so this is uh, the R prime HK index. So high activity stars up here, low activity stars down here, as a function of stellar age. And the the sort of gray banana in the background that is a sample of solar analogs um, that show this sort of very tight relation, uh, power law relation between activity and and age. And there is no apparent discontinuity at middle age where this weakened magnetic breaking kicks in. So we scratch our heads a little bit and then we realize, you know, if you look at the sun the, and decompose the field into the various uh, components, the strength, the overall strength of the dipole field in the sun is like of order one Gauss. Whereas if you just zoom in on a little patch of, of empty sun, uh, the average magnetic field in there is a couple hundred Gauss, right? So you can lose your ability to organize the field on the largest scales and the S index or the R prime HK index, uh, which measures over all spatial scales, doesn't even notice that it's gone, right? You're, you're, you're disappearing half a percent of the total field. And because the measure of activity integrates over all those spatial scales, um, you, don't, you don't notice the disappearance of large scale organization. And you would expect this to be perfectly continuous, okay? So that's cool. Oh, and one other kind of cool thing. So the, the blue points here are uh, bright test uh, astroseismology targets that we've been able to, to put on here over the last couple of years. This is, this is from a paper by Dan Hoover. Uh, and, you know, it looks like there's a, a bit of scatter here. Here's two stars with the same age and very different uh, activity levels. Uh, but it turns out that they have different masses and so we're starting to be able to define this relationship between activity and age as a function of mass, as you would expect it to depend on mass because main sequence lifetimes are different for different stars of different masses, right? And so there will be different relations for stars of different masses. And we're starting to fill this in with, with stars uh, over a range of masses. So we can calibrate that relationship between activity and age. And once you do that, then if you get a measurement of activity, you can get the age of any star. Uh, what are, and of whatever mass, right? So that's a, an exciting possibility for the future. Okay, so what about activity cycles and variability? Well, from the, uh, these are uh, composite time series of the S index um, for a bunch of uh, sun-like stars, solar analogs. So when stars like the sun are young, they have higher overall magnetic activity levels. They have uh, larger variability around that average level and, and more complex uh, variability. It's, it tends to be multi-periodic multi in the youngest stars. Um, but as stars age, as we saw in the previous slide, their activity levels decrease over time. Um, their variability also decreases over time. And, and by the age of the sun, you get this nice sort of well-ordered um, very single monoperiodic uh, activity cycles like we, like we see in the sun. And then beyond the age of the sun, um, those cycles eventually disappear. You, you still have magnetic activity. You can measure the S index. Uh, there are there are significant magnetic flux there, but it's no longer cycling, okay? So that's one of the clues that we have to work with. Um, and one of the other interesting things about um, this idea that there's a critical Rossby number where things start to change <clears throat> is that the Rossby number is uh, very strongly correlated with the activity level, right? It's the, uh, just like this Kumanis relation, rotation and activity decrease together. So the Rossby number, which is a normalized version of the rotation period, is going to be strongly correlated with the activity level, at least up to the age of the sun, right? And so for, for any star, you can translate the critical Rossby number into a critical activity level. And um, 
this is the critical activity level that corresponds to the critical Rossby number um, for the sun. And it runs uh, just a, a little bit above the solar minimum value of the S index. And uh, the picture that we have uh, is that basically, if you think of this critical Rossby number or critical activity level as the dividing line between stars that show cycles at higher activity levels and stars that don't show cycles, you know, it represents um, a sort of regime change in this stellar dynamo. Uh, as you evolve through that um, critical activity level, you basically are losing the ability to generate cyclic activity. I'll come back to that towards the end. Okay, now <clears throat> this is an updated version of that um, plot from Erica Bonvitens that I started with. So just rotation period versus activity cycle period. Uh, I've updated it to include um, a few more stars that have been, uh, whose activity cycles have been uh, discovered in the meantime. I've also color coded the points to show you kind of the spectral type of the star. So hotter stars are shown in blue, solar-like in sort of uh, yellow and orange and cooler K-type stars in red. Uh, and so, uh, and then the other thing is that I've added some, some of these flat activity stars, stars that are below that activity level where they show clear cycles, but they still have activity and that activity varies on rotational timescales. So you can still measure the rotation periods, but there's just constant activity, no cycles. And so they're sort of like lower limits on the cycle period in, in a way. So I've added those along the type top at their known rotation periods. And in particular for this series of solar analogs really suggests a, a very different evolutionary picture. <clears throat> so the idea is as you know, magnetic breaking is operating, stars are slowing their rotation periods and their activity cycle periods would grow longer along one of these sequences or both of these sequences. I'm just gonna ignore this upper sequence for the moment. Uh, but when they reach the critical Rossby number, uh, their rotation period basically stops changing. And what apparently happens, just looking at this series of solar analogs, is that the cycle period, you know, from about 4 billion years to 5 billion years to 7 billion years, the, the cycle period is getting longer until and, and lower in amplitude um, until it eventually disappears. And what you see is a, is a flat activity star. So either there is no cycle or the cycle is so weak that we can no longer measure it, right? And we have examples of this among the hotter stars and among the cooler stars as well. So this may be a way of understanding now why the sun is here in the middle, because it's beyond the critical Rossby number and its cycle, according to this picture, should be getting longer and weaker over time as it evolves through this critical activity level. And so the sun's on its way up. And that's why, even though the well-studied solar twin, 18 SCO, you know, is a lot closer to this normal uh, relationship. Okay, so that's our picture of the evolution of stellar cycles. Now, I'll just mention here a star that we're going to see a little bit later, HD 166620. <clears throat> this is a star that, you know, is kind of at the same level above that lower sequence as the sun is. And so we're gonna, we're gonna revisit that star in a minute. So in the meantime, uh, I'm gonna show you the latest results for a couple of pairs of stars where um, for, for this hotter pair of stars and for this series of solar analogs, I'm gonna show you some more direct measurements of their magnetic field configuration. So if you really wanna characterize the magnetic fields of sun-like stars, uh, the tool of choice is spectropolarimetry, okay? Uh, because it allows you, is it's most sensitive to the largest scale magnetic fields. And so it can serve as a kind of binary test for the presence or, or not of the large scale fields that drive magnetic breaking. Uh, and so uh, in 2019, uh, we went to the Large Binocular Telescope, which, which just had a brand new spectropolarimeter developed for it by Klaus Strassmeyer at the AIP in Germany. Um, and we went back in 2021 to follow up on, on an additional set of stars. So that's what I'm going to show you now. <clears throat> 
Okay, so for that hotter pair of stars, we got snapshots of the uh, spectropolarimetric uh, Stokes V signature um, for those for those two stars that are that are hotter than the sun, um, which we have come to find out are, are you know, 2.4 giga year and 9.8 giga year. And so what we're looking at here, Stokes V is uh, one of the four Stokes parameters. It's the one that has the highest amplitude with the strength of the magnetic field. And you're looking at it, uh, basically it's the degree of circular polarization across the line profile, okay? And the full scale here is plus or minus 0.01%. So like these variations are a few parts in 100,000. They're, they're tiny variations in polarization induced by the magnetic field, okay? Uh, <clears throat> and so this uh, is the, 88 Leo is the star sort of down on the normal sequence of, uh, between the rotation period and the cycle period. Uh, and sure enough, it shows a clear signature of a, of a large scale magnetic field across the line profile, right? Um, the flat activity star that has the same rotation period and is quite a lot older, um, you know, we see a little blip, it's statistically insignificant. Um, so it's technically a null detection, but you can make various assumptions about the geometry of the magnetic field and place upper limits on how, how strong the magnetic field can be to produce that signature or that noise, depending on your perspective. Um, now, when you combine measurements like these of the strength of the large scale magnetic field from spectropolarimetry with <clears throat> something like the um, estimate of the mass loss rate from X-ray fluxes, uh, the known rotation periods of the star, the global properties like mass and, and radius, you can put all of these things together to, to estimate the actual um, uh, torque that the uh, magnetic braking is inducing on the star, the wind braking torque, uh, or equivalently the, the rate of angular momentum loss from the stellar wind, okay? So you can use all these additional observables um, of which the geometry of the magnetic field is the most important uh, to, to estimate the wind breaking torque of the angular momentum loss rate. And what we find is that between the ages of these two stars, the uh, wind breaking torque changes from you know, four times 10 to the 30 uh, and decreases to, to upper limit that is more than 10 times weaker by the, by the older star. So this is, this is the first evidence of how much weakened magnetic braking was, was um, becoming weaker across that transition. Um, so an order of magnitude change in the magnetic braking torque uh, qualifies as weakened magnetic braking, I think. But um, these changes are, are dominated by the morphology of the magnetic field. And we just have these, these, these snapshots of a single, a single rotational phase of the star. Um, and so, you know, it's a little bit ambiguous because we don't know the full 3D geometry of the magnetic field. We just like, maybe we just got lucky and we caught a particularly active longitude here. And we were looking at a very inactive longitude for the, for the other one. And so what you really want is a series of, of magnetic field observations as the star rotates. So you can reconstruct the full 3D geometry of the magnetic field, right? And this technique has been developed over the last decades called Zeeman Doppler imaging. Uh, and it's now a well-established tool for, for doing exactly that. And so uh, for our next evolutionary sequence, that's what we did. We tapped into the existing archive of complete magnetic field maps, 3D maps, for uh, some young solar type stars. So HD 76151, these, these are the ones that were labeled on the uh, cycle versus rotation period plot before. So young normal cycle has a dominated by a dipole field, a tilted dipole field. 18 SCO um, starting to come off of that, peel off of that lower sequence of cycles. It has a slightly more complex magnetic field. And then 16 SIG A and B, uh, flat activity stars at the same rotation periods. All of these have basically the same rotation periods uh, and no cycles up here. And, and, and indeed you see no evidence 
for a large scale magnetic field in those stars. And you can do the same trick. So just place upper limits based on what you observe, upper limits on the field strength. And so what you find for the series of solar analogs is that once again, uh, more than a factor of 10 decrease in the, in the wind breaking torque uh, across the transition, across this critical Rossby number. And then continued evolution, another 20% decrease by the age of 18 SCO, or sorry, by the age of, of 16 SIG. So, so the picture is really that uh, uh, the spectral polarimetric observations are really supporting this idea that uh, the, the uh, decrease in large scale organization of the field could be responsible for the decrease in the, in the strength of magnetic breaking across that critical Rossby number. Um, <clears throat> now, we haven't yet extended this to stars that are cooler than the sun, but we already have um, observation time uh, approved for the uh, coming semester. Uh, and this is one of our targets that is a very intriguing. Uh, so this is the one that is an outlier similar to the sun among the cool stars. And this star showed um, <clears throat> a regular activity cycle during the Mount Wilson survey, which unfortunately stopped here with the black points. But fortunately, the Keck Observatory has continued monitoring this star as part of the planet search. And, and um, you know, they also observed it uh, in the late 90s <clears throat> when the Mount Wilson survey was still going, and they found measurements that are consistent in the late 90s. But for the last 20 years, the star has been in constant activity. The cycle disappeared. And this is the first documented case of a star entering a magnetic min minimum while we watch. So the sun has done this in the past few hundred years ago. The Maunder minimum is the famous example uh, where the sunspot uh, cycle just disappeared for a few cycles and then came back. So if we keep watching it, you know, maybe we'll see this 17 or 16 year cycle come back. But <clears throat> But this cluster of points here is where you'd expect the next maximum to be, and it's just nowhere to be seen. So uh, for 20 years, it's been a flat activity star. We're gonna go observe it with uh, LBT next semester uh, to see what its large scale magnetic field looks like. But um, the critical Rossby number for this star corresponds to this activity level here. So this star is spending like half of its time in a regime where dynamos don't wanna drive cycles anymore. Uh, and, you know, as it ages, that average activity level is going to go lower and lower until it gets down here and it'll just stay. It, there's no way it can jump across that, that dividing line. Uh, that's our, 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 our best understanding of what's going on in this. Okay. All right. So kind of returning to a, to a kind of broader view, um, the, the, the best sort of... Um, big picture understanding of what might be going on in stellar evolution to, to understand this general picture is a, a picture put forward by Cecilia Garofa a few years ago about magnetic complexity. And there's a kind of symmetry in this, which is really beautiful. Um, we've known for a while that very young stars, you know, have complex magnetic fields and they're in this so-called saturated regime where there's not a clear um, they basically show a range of rotation rates at, a, at the same activity level. Um, but what appears to happen is that, so this is a magnetic complexity parameter. This is just basically like a cartoon model as well, where you have a magnetic complexity parameter versus Rossby number. And so young stars show this complex magnetic field. It evolves into this Skumanich regime where rotation and activity de uh, decrease together over time. But then uh, the unanticipated thing um, that is really interesting is that, this, that uh, late after the middle of the main sequence lifetime, late in the age of a star, uh, the magnetic field becomes more complex again. Uh, and, and this sort of picture of, of, of complexity um, becoming, uh, magnetic field becoming less complex and then more complex, um, can simultaneously explain the behavior that you see in young star clusters, sort of the, the range of, of, um, of rotation rates at, at, at the same activity level, um, and also the observations of anomalous rotation from the old Kepler field stars. <clears throat> 
Um, so I like to call this uh, third regime the decoupled regime because we've, as we've seen, um, the rotation rate basically stops changing, but the activity level continues to decline. And you know something's got to be driving the continued decrease of the activity level, and it's no longer rotation. So they're decoupled, um, and what we think it is is the uh, slow changes in the temperature of the star that just affect the ability uh, to generate magnetic field on small scales through helicity driven by convection, okay? So that's the kind of emerging picture uh, for the, the big picture of what's happening in stellar evolution to explain this. And I like the simplicity of it. That's, that's why I'm sharing. Okay, so the very intriguing thing that connects to planetary habitability and where, what might we expect to find complex civilizations um, is that our best current estimate of when this um, transition, magnetic transition in sun-like stars kicks in around middle age, it turns out to be just a few hundred uh, million years ago for the sun. And that coincides with the point at which, uh, so life had existed for a long time before that in the oceans, which are well shielded from the radiation and charged particles that are coming off of the sun and space weather. Uh, but a few hundred million years ago, life emerged from the oceans onto land. And that was around the time that this magnetic transition happened. And so it may very well be the case that the best places to look for uh, advanced civilizations, technological societies, could be uh, stars in the second half of their mean sequence lifetimes after the magnetic activity has calmed down and settled into this um, sort of more stable environment uh, where the magnetic field is more complex. And so flares cannot bust out of the, of the, of the small scale magnetic field and, and uh, pummel the stars with, with charged particles and radiation. It's speculative, I know, but it's an intriguing possibility that might focus our efforts to find life in the universe. Okay, uh, with that, I'm just gonna leave up my summary of conclusions and I will take your questions. Right, questions for Travis. I think um, folks in Hilo and Maui, I think your audio we will not be able to hear you if you talk. So if you can type your question into the chat, I can relay it here. I have a pad and I can see you type. Um, but let's start with people in the room for Noah. Hi, my friend Maxwell. My name is Julia. I work in the planetary finder system. So I have a question about binary. So uh, I've just told the stuff about uh, uh, activity cycle versus rotation period. Also, uh, in the System in binding system and with the companion have some interaction and with the pattern compared to single system. And I see some uh, star you're showing here are binary or triple system. Yeah, for sure. If the if the binaries are interacting at all to the extent that um, they're modifying the stellar evolution. Then, then you would expect that there would be different relationships between rotation and activity and age, for sure. Um, but it, uh, if they're well separated so that they're effectively evolving as single stars, then you don't have to worry about it. Um, you can imagine that close binaries are obviously gonna um, produce changes, can produce changes in the rotation periods that are gonna be different from what you'd find in isolated stars, right? Did that answer your question? Yeah. So, um, aside from perhaps an aggressive campaign of CDI observations, what prospects are there for testing the Garapa model of complexity of Well, so that model is actually rooted in, so it's easier to measure the magnetic um, field geometry of young, rapidly rotating stars. So the, <clears throat> the observations that have already been done so far um, 
actually support that picture because the, the picture was motivated in part by those observations, right? Um, it, it's what it was meant to, to try to explain. Um, at, the, at the old end, <clears throat> we really do need to fill in uh, the information that we have about stars that are older than the sun uh, to really solidify that picture. Um, these snapshots are enormously helpful just as a reconnaissance but um, there's no getting around that you need full Zeeman Doppler image maps um, for the stars if you wanna remove those ambiguities and really put this on a more solid footing. And uh, Jen and I just got an NSF grant together where this is part of the program to, to do that at CFHT, so. Yeah. Why are you such a land lover? Like why can't you just have the advanced civilizations under the water? You don't really care about that. <clears throat> well, um, as much as I would like to see uh, radio communications from intelligent dolphins, um, the dolphins here haven't developed radio communications yet, so I see no reason, even though they're very intelligent, right? So I don't see any reason to expect that it would be different on other ocean worlds. So sorry. <laughs> Travis, uh, you mentioned something about the magnetic field of a of a small localized region of the sun not being very indicative of, say, the weakening of some really large scale magnetic field. So, could you explain that to me again, and also perhaps re relate that to the spectral point of magnetic fields that we mentioned? Yeah, yeah. So, so um, spectral polarimetry is only sensitive to the largest scale magnetic field, basically for the same reason, for geometric cancellation, because of geometric cancellation. It's the same reason we can only detect the low degree oscillations in from the from the solar like oscillations, because you get uh, as you divide the as you make it more and more complex, the plus and minus patches cancel out, basically, right? And so what what remains from the uh, integration over the surface is just too small to measure. Um, so in terms of like, <clears throat> try to make it more clear about the connection to the large scale magnetic field. So our best, our best model for what's going on is the sun, right? And <clears throat> what we know in the sun is what we think in the sun, but we still haven't successfully explained the 11 year solar cycle, but um, the large scale magnetic field is twisted up accumulates at the bottom of the convection zone and then rise, rises buoyantly and twists a little bit as it rises because of Coriolis forces, right? <clears throat> and so it emerges as bipolar active regions. So you have positive and negative flux um, at slightly different latitudes. And that tilt is actually essential because most of that flux just cancels out, but a little bit of the trailing flux is transported towards the poles by meridional circulation, and a little bit of the a leading flux uh, cancels across the equator. <clears throat> and so the large scale field is just what you have left over that accumulates at the pole from this process over the solar cycle. Um, but it's, it's, so, so, it's, so if, you Im if you imagine it as just what's left over after most of the stuff cancels out, right, then it's easy to understand why its strength is only like half a percent of the total strength of small scale elements that are really dominating in a measurement of that, that integrates over all spatial scales like that. Yeah. So it's really powerful to combine these two things, spectral polarimetry that only is basically only probes the largest scales and the traditional activity measures that measure uh, the magnetic flux on all scales, right? Because then you get a sense of the absolute strength of the magnetic field and then what kind of tiny fraction of it is, is uh, organized at large scales. Um, you, I don't know if I missed this, you may have mentioned it, but so you said um, you use calcium H and K to measure the magnetic, so to measure the uh, estimates. Um, can you explain why the calcium HNK and if there are any other lines that you can use? Yeah, so the emission in the calcium HNK line cores <clears throat> is basically a measure of magnetic heating in the chromosphere. So it's it's non non thermal. It's like uh, 
caused by the magnetic field. That's our best understanding. I mean, this goes back to, I mean, the, even the, the name H and K, right? When, when Fraunhofer originally looked at the spectrum and he didn't know what any of the lines were, he just labeled them A, B, C, D, E, G, right? And those were the H and K lines. <clears throat> That's where they got their names. Um, but yeah, subsequent observations of the sun, mostly where we can actually see that there's a dark spot there that's full of magnetic field and, and we can measure it, spatially resolve it with spectral polarimetry, uh, you know, those areas are bright in the calcium H and K lines. And so it's just very clearly related to magne mag magnetic heating in the chromosphere. Yeah. Uh, I was interested in the uh, symmetric evolution of the uh, field morphology. Um, and I was curious about at early times, how do stars kind of uh, rapidly take momentum despite that really tight, complex field morphology? Um, and kind of the early times, or does that happen after the field uh, morphology simplified and gets larger scale? Yeah, it happens later. It does. Yeah, they're not losing. They are losing angular momentum from primarily from uh, coronal mass ejections. It dominates in, in those young stars. <clears throat> so um, they're much more magnetically active. And so they produce uh, more frequent and more energetic flares that actually yeah, completely dominate, that have associated coronal mass ejections. And those dominate the angular momentum loss uh, in younger stars. Um, you're in that saturated regime for quite a while before you hit the, the schematic re regime. And, and, and that's kind of defined by when rotation and activity are strongly coupled. Yeah. Good. Would you like to speculate on prospects for reconciling the Garapa model of increasing complexity of the beam of all stars with the detection of the net? Magnetism with the dipole modes and the giants. Yeah, I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, there's um, these red giants, I'm guessing, are evolved from stars that are more massive than the sun, significantly more massive, right? And um, yeah, there's there's a, a bit of a different evolution there, right? Because um, above the craft break, you never spin down on the main sequence. But um, it is it is possibly consistent with this picture because so we did a paper a couple of years ago where in the sub subgiant phase is actually when you get the maximum difference between these two models um, between the model of standard spin down and the weakened breaking model because um, the difference between the predictions of those two models accumulates over the second half of the main sequence lifetime. And so it's maximum at the subgiant branch, basically. <clears throat> and uh, if you look at it in this, in the context of uh, how does the Rossby number change with age, it turns out that for stars that are a bit more massive than the sun, um, they will cross that critical Rossby number um, but then when they do the, the hook in the subgiant phase, they can come back down below the Rossby number and re-excite uh, re cycles once again before they climb the red giant branch. And so there's a mechanism for actually having uh, activity cycles are actually observed in a few subgiant stars and nobody understood why, but this is a mechanism for understanding that as well. Um, it hasn't been extended to the red giant phase, to my knowledge, but I do know that there is a huge library of uh, Mount Wilson observations of red giants from the last couple decades of the survey that <clears throat> have never seen the light of day, like exist. And I know who has them, it's Ricky Egeland, um, but he's been trying to get support for a few years to make the, those data public and uh, has so far been unsuccessful, but I'm, I'm, I feel pretty confident after this discovery of the mag, uh, grand minimum star that <clears throat> maybe people will uh, appreciate the significance of the, and the value of these kind of observations and those, uh, that archive of data will, will eventually become available and maybe could weigh in on that, that question. That's cool, that's good to know. 
So I checked the Zoom. I don't see any hands for chat, but in case you don't like raising your hand, chat. Show your video now. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's thank Travis again. We're going to take a